Hello, everyone. It's Miss Kelly with your MTL, and welcome to our Wade In and Dive Deep program, where we will explore various facts and information about the ocean that will be a critical base for what you're about to experience this summer during our Oceans of Possibility summer reading event. So as you can see, it's ocean themed. We're gonna be learning about the ocean as a whole, the oceans around the planet and the animals that live inside it and why it is so important to be a big contributor to the ocean's overall health. Because whether it's far or whether it's near, the ocean is a big part of our lives on planet Earth. So let's learn a little bit about the ocean in general. Definition of an ocean. An ocean is a noun. It is a large expanse of sea. In particular, each of the main areas into which the sea is divided geographically. So in the next slide, we'll see a map of the earth and where the different oceans are located and what their names are. They are divided geographically. A sea, which I know sometimes ocean and sea get interchanged, but there is a slight difference. A sea is an expanse of salt water that covers most of the Earth's surface it surrounds and its surrounding land masses. So, hmm. so if an ocean is a big body of water and a sea is an expanse of salt water, how are they not the same? Well, in terms of geography, seas are smaller than oceans and are usually located where the land and the ocean meet. So sometimes you might be in, let's see, the, the Sea of Japan. That is a space of water that is between the, the island nation of Japan and mainland Asia, which is China. It is just a chunk of salt water that covers part of its surrounding land masses, but it is not an ocean. They are also sometimes completely enclosed by land. So the, um, the Baltic Sea. The Baltic Sea is also in Asia, but closer to Europe. It is completely enclosed within its landmass, but it is salt water and it is large. Therefore, it is a sea. Oceans cover approximately 70% of the Earth's surface. That's a common um, fact that you will find all over the place. People will say like, oh yeah, the planet's three quarters worth of water. And it is, there's a lot of water to go around. And it contains 97% of the Earth's water supply. Just think, let that sink in for a minute. Only 3% of the Earth's water is not in an ocean. And since we are a state that is surrounded by lakes, and the Great Lakes are a very important resource, we are so lucky. But even that is like a percentage, teeny tiny percentage of the water on the planet. It's all in the oceans. And while we have different names for different portions of the ocean that is surrounding our planet, it is sometimes just called the Great Ocean when you are in referring to all the water across the globe. All right, here are those ocean names. You will recognize over here, that's where we live, the United States. And right now we live near the Atlantic Ocean. The Atlantic Ocean spans between the Northern American continent over to Europe and Africa. Now this is technically the Atlantic Ocean as well between South America and Africa, as it's referred to as the Southern Ocean. Over on our East Coast, towards California, that's where you meet the Pacific Ocean. The Pacific Ocean is the largest geographical ocean on the planet because it wraps all the way around from North America over to Asia. You were talking about Japan earlier. Here's that Sea of Japan right here. We also have the Indian Ocean because it goes right up to the country of India between Africa and Australia. And down here is a little known ocean called Oceana, which is around Australia, New Zealand, and Antarctica. And way up on the top of the planet is the Arctic Ocean. That will be surrounding the North Pole, uh, Greenland, parts of Canada, Russia, and just where all the coldness usually sits. So do you think you can remember where all those oceans are? Take a look at the map a little longer. Now, 
which ones which. Can you think of which ones where? What about the one that's right here? The one between North America and Europe? The Atlantic Ocean, yes. Atlantic Ocean was actually named after Atlantis, which is another big story we might be able to tell you about this summer, but it was always a mythological city that was somewhere beyond Spain and the Horn of Africa. So it became the Atlantic Ocean. This part is still the Atlantic, but what is it also called? That's south, so it's the Southern Ocean. And over on our East Coast, the biggest ocean on the planet that goes all the way around pretty much. Yes, that's the Pacific Ocean. The Pacific Ocean was actually named because of its peacefulness. Like when you pacify, you are calming, you are being, you know, nice and steady. The Pacific Ocean isn't actually super peaceful all the time, but we can't change names like that after it was really stuck. And how about this one over here? The Indian Ocean. That one's always easy to remember because it's right by India. And up at the top of the globe, where it's really cold in the North Pole, the Arctic Ocean is sometimes just called the Arctic regions, and that'll help you remember that. Not Antarctica, Arctic. And what about our little lesser known one over by Australia? Yes, Oceana. It seems kind of redundant to name an ocean Oceana, but it's cute, it's fun. It's the last ocean you need to know. Now within the ocean itself, there are different zones. We have names for the big parts on the surface and everything that's underneath it, but it's like a little jello salad. We got a whole bunch of things that are stacked up on each other. At the very top of the ocean is called the sunlight zone, which is where sunlight can penetrate. And this is really crucial for a lot of sea life, particularly any type of plant that is living in the ocean, since they still go through photosynthesis, even though they're under the water, and they need that sunlight to produce energy, chlorophyll, oxygen, which in turn helps supply the rest of the ocean with oxygen and all the animals that live there. So you will find lots of fishes, turtles, sharks, stuff like that up at the sunlight zone. Anything that needs any type of light, will be visiting or living in the sunlight zone. Twilight zone is where it gets a little bit darker. You might be able to get a little bit of sunlight penetration in there, but it's gonna be mostly darker. It's called twilight because of, think about, let's see, since it's the summer, think about like 8, 8.30 at night, where it's just starting to sunset a little bit, and you can see still pretty well, but things are getting a little blurry, a little gray. That is our twilight zone. And the midnight zone is kind of like nighttime in the ocean. Mostly dark, no sunlight penetrates unless it's at the very surface where it meets the twilight zone. So it's gonna be dark. You, you wouldn't be able to see anything without a flashlight. There's still plenty of animals who live down in the midnight zone who don't need sunlight, but you're not gonna find any plants down in the midnight zone. And even below that is an area known as the abyss. Abysses are, it's a fun word, isn't it? Abyss, where it's just deep and wide and kind of barren, but not the ocean abyss. There are still animals down there. There are plants at the base of the ocean on the ocean floor that don't require sunlight. Those are mostly going to be different types of tube worms and anemones and other type of um, urchins and stuff like that. They don't need the sunlight so they can survive down in the abyss. And the animals down there are super interesting because they have to adapt without any sunlight as well. And even below the abyss, you will find some trenches in the ocean. They are the deepest part that you can possibly go. And the deepest trench on the planet is called the Marianas Trench. And we don't even really know how deep it goes. We've tried, we've definitely tried to go down to the bottom of it, but it just keeps going. We have no idea. So who knows what's down there? <laughs> it's just a wonderful mystery. 
Now here's some examples of those animals that you would find in the sunlight zone. We talked about fish and coral reefs. You'd find sea turtles, sharks, jellies, and a whole bunch of other animals that would just be floating around in the nice sunlight and having a good time. Fun question, do you know what kind of shark that is? It's kind of distinguished by its wide, flat nose, its bullish temper. There is a hint. <laughs> it is a bull shark. Bull sharks are super unique because they have the um, rare capability to adapt to different kinds of water. Normally sharks are only found in salt water, but bull sharks can actually live in freshwater bodies. So you can find them up rivers. And in a very rare instance, you could find one in a lake if it managed to get there somehow, but not the Great Lakes. Don't worry about that. Now down in the twilight zone, here's some animals you might see. The top left is a sperm whale. And while they will go up to the surface, whales are mammals, they need air. They will need to go to the surface. They love to hang down in that twilight zone because that's where their favorite food lives. And those are squid. That is the picture below it. That is a type of squid. But sperm whales are also known for hunting giant squid, which we rarely get to see because they don't come up to the surface at all. You'll also find octopus and maybe some type of special mollusks and urchins like the spiny thing down below. As you go deeper, there is less defined shape when it comes to animals. You'll see that like above we had shells, we had a bunch of fins and delicate features. But as you go lower in the ocean, the pressure increases. So they need more soft bodies, something to help them float throughout the high pressure like squids and octopuses. Now down in the midnight zone, this is where it gets kind of creepy, but if you ask me, it also gets really cool. But at the top is one of the sharks that will actually live down in the deep water. That is a frilled shark. It's named after the red gills that you can see through those slits, how it looks like nice red lace along its face. It's really long and skinny, kind of like an eel, but it's a shark. And underneath that is a very popular and common angler fish. There's definitely different kinds of angler fish that you will see, different shapes and sizes. But fun fact, the ones that are iconically angler fish, like the ones with the little light bobber that they have on their heads, those are always female. Males don't have those. So if you ever see a picture of an angler fish with a little light, it's going to be a girl. Over on the right top, we have what is called a gulper eel or a pelican eel. That's because it has a huge mouth and a teeny body, but it can swallow things that are so much bigger than itself. And it just balloons up in those big cheeks and just swallows it whole. I encourage you to find a picture of with, it, with its mouth closed. It's insane. And right beneath it, is actually one of the animals on our dive into Marshall quest this summer. That is the vampire squid, which is neither a vampire or a squid. It does appear to look like one since it has the arms and tentacles on its body. And it kind of inflates like an umbrella and it has little hooks underneath it to help it catch prey. But it's named the vampire squid because when it inflates like that, the first people who saw it thought it kind of looked like Dracula's cape. Now down to the abyss, the deep, deep down water <laughs> where things do still live. And they're hard to get good pictures of because it's very dark down there. We have to bring lights. And they are very neutrally colored. They blend in very well. We have different types of fishes that are going to, again, be very squishy and skinny with big eyes. The one that is at the bottom left here, that is called a tripod fish because it's fins down at the bottom there. You'll see they're very long and skinny. And it actually uses those to kind of walk slowly along the ocean floor. It doesn't really swim. It just kind of uses its fins as little almost stilts to just walk forward. Super cool. Over on the top right here, we have what is known as the hagfish. It is a very old fish. Um, 
but it is also kind of sad because it has a name like a hagfish. It was named by early 1800s explorers who happened to pull them up in their nets and they thought they were just so ugly. And I guess the best term they had for ugly back then was a hag. So hagfish. Hagfish are super unique because they only have to eat about every six months. Their metabolism is so slow. But that's good for them because down at the bottom of the ocean, there aren't a whole lot of food opportunities. They mostly eat on carcasses that have died in the upper ocean and then slowly float to the bottom. And then that's when the hagfish have their buffet and they're good for another six months. They're also really unique when it comes to their defenses. With the slightest touch of their skin, they can eject this slimy goo, and that'll just completely clog up any type of predator's mouth and gills, which gives the hagfish a chance to swim away. And down at the bottom here is a really cute example of an octopus that lives really, really deep down in the ocean. That is called a dumbbell octopus, named for its little ear flaps that flute along in the water underneath, and it looks kind of like Dumbo the Flying Elephant from the Disney film. Okay, time for a game. We're gonna play two truths and a lie. On our screen here, we have three statements, and one of them is not true. And these are about the ocean floor. So, hydrothermal vents, which are fissures found on the sea floor, can reach temperatures as high as 865 degrees Fahrenheit. That's our first statement. Secondly, many animals that live near the ocean floor are green or blue in color. And third, we know more about the surface of Mars than we do about the depths of the ocean and the ocean floor. So which one of those three statements do you think is a lie? I might have put a hint in one of our earlier slides. Okay. So do you think hydrothermal vents can reach up to 865 degrees? Well, they can. It's insane. But because they are right on the ocean floor, which is essentially the Earth's crust, they are right next to a lot of the molten rock that is right underneath all of that. And when all of the air and gases get released up into the ocean, it can be really, really hot. And you'd think nothing would be able to live there. But you're wrong. There are you just bring tube worms and little shrimps and crabs that actually live right around these vents. Because while it's just steam and bubbles mostly, there's also a lot of minerals that are coming out of there. And it's super good for their nutrition. There are whole ecosystems built around these super hot vents. Many animals that live near the ocean floor are green or blue in color. That's our lie. They are not green and blue, usually at the bottom of the ocean. A lot of them actually happen to be red. Now, that would help them just stick out really badly, wouldn't it? But the fun thing is, you need light to be able to see the color red. So down in the bottom of the ocean, where there is no sunlight, red actually helps them appear darker in the area around them. So it's actually a form of camouflage. So there will be ones that are actually dark, dark gray or black, but a lot of them happen to be red. And the last one now we know is true that we do know more about the surface of Mars than we do about our depths of our ocean and the ocean floor. And that's just because we have a hard place time getting there. It's just, we can't build machinery that would be able to withstand that pressure and to be able to bring oxygen with us to breathe. And it's a big puzzle. So we're hoping to find out more. Another game, Two Truths and a Lie, this time about sharks. And I love sharks, so I had to include one on sharks. So, number one, all sharks are cold-blooded. Two, sharks can be found at all depths of the ocean. And three, sharks are older than trees. Which one do you think is the lie? Hmm. All right, let's go down the list. All sharks are cold-blooded. Is that true? It is false. Our lie is right at the beginning of our list. Not all sharks are cold-blooded. The majority of them, yes. But a lot of the highly migratory sharks, like makos and great whites, have this really interesting ability inside 
that they can actually switch between cold bloodedness and warm bloodedness. And when they have to, that need to go very far, very fast, they can trigger it so that they can use all that energy. And it also helps when they need to go deep into the ocean. Whites usually hang out towards the surface, but they have been known to kind of cruise down at about 3,000 feet and just kind of chill in the currents down there. But it's really cold down there. And if they just stayed down there forever, or even for a good length of time, they would freeze. So they can turn on that warm-blooded switch and stay nice and comfortable, even though they're in a really cold part of the ocean. And that kind of answered our next question. Sharks can be found at all depths of the ocean. That is true. There are different sharks that live at the surface, at midnight, twilight, and in the abyss. I didn't count the trenches because I don't think we honestly know if there are any sharks in the trenches, but I wouldn't be surprised if there were. And yes, sharks are older than trees. In our evolutionary timeline, we have record fossil records of sharks before there were even trees on the land. There might have been some type of small shrubbery and ferns, but for the most part, there were no trees around. And sharks didn't care because they were in the ocean. One more round before we get some extra info. Two truths and a lie about reefs. Corals in their younger life stages can swim and move around. Climate change is a huge threat to corals, which support 20% of ocean creatures. And certain corals can live without sunlight, and they are called ghost corals for their white color. Now think a moment on which one you think might not be true. Which ones are lie? Okay, let's start at the top. Corals in their younger life stages can swim and move around. That is true. Corals, though you might imagine them being big bulky rocks that make up part of a reef, are actually animals. There are some calcium and other mineral deposits that they live on, but at the surface of all of that is our corals are tiny little organisms. They're super cool. And when they are really young, they're actually free floating. They're like little ocean jelly beans or little Cheetos that float around in the water and they can move until they get to a certain stage where they need to take root and grow into a reef-like form. They can go wherever they want. And how about climate change is a huge threat to corals which support 20% of the ocean's creatures. Unfortunately, that's true. Due to climate change and the increasing acidity and warmth of the ocean, it is not conducive to make corals really happy. So they die and corals supporting 80% of creatures in the ocean affects the other animals that live around the corals. The animals that eat the corals, that use the oxygen from the corals, since they are part, some of corals do have um, photosynthesis capabilities. Animals that use coral for protection or defense, it's, a big problem. And we need to work on making sure that corals can stick around and help all the other animals around them. There are certain marine institutes and aquariums that are helping to regrow coral in their storage units so that they can be transplanted back into the ocean. But a big way that we can help with that is making sure that the ocean temperature doesn't get too high and stop dumping a bunch of bad stuff into the ocean, which increases the acidity. Because imagine you swimming in a pool full of Coca-Cola. That might sound fun, but it would not be good for your skin. Now, our last fact now we know is a lie. Certain corals can live without sunlight and they are called ghost corals for their white color. Now, chlorophyll, and which is a big part of coral, needs sunlight. So they definitely need to be on that sunlit zone, but you can find white corals, and the sad part is it's because they are bleached from too much exposure, too much heat, and when a coral turns white, it it's dead. So we don't want white coral. We want nice, bright, colorful coral. So why should we love the ocean? And this is a big info dump, so stay with me. This is a lot of important facts. Ocean trash can be broken up into smaller pieces known as microplastics. And by sun exposure and wave action, and after which they find their way into the ocean food chain, the animals don't really know what they are. And if it's part 
of where they eat things or if it happens to get in the way, then yes, animals will eat those microplastics. And when eventually the other plastics degrade, which can take up to 400 years, the process releases chemicals into the water and that further contaminates it. So that's, that's not good. Just try to be, always put yourself in the animal's mindset where if all of a sudden you were trying to take a bite of your favorite sandwich and all of a sudden it just had like a CD in the middle of it. You don't want that. So as unsightly as ocean pollution is, we can't see the worst of it because the 70% of ocean garbage actually sinks to the seafloor, which makes it even harder for us to clean up. So you might not think the ocean is dirty because you can't see it. It's there. In 2004, scientists counted 146 hypoxic zones, which are areas in the ocean where the oxygen, con oxygen concentration is so low that animals can't breathe, even though they need to get oxygen out of the water. And if they can't get that oxygen, they die. And by 2008, that number jumped to 405. And in 2017, in the Gulf of Mexico, there was a hypoxic zone that was labeled as the size of New Jersey. That is the largest one ever measured. So it's getting worse, and we don't want this to happen. <laughs> and one effect of greenhouse emissions is increased ox um, ocean acidification. We talked about that briefly about the coral. And that makes it more difficult for bivalves like coral and mussel and clams and oysters to form shells. And that decreases their likelihood of survival because that's their defense, that's their home. And that upsets the food chain too, because even though that makes some animals happier, maybe that they can get a bit easier meal because the mollusks and clams can't defend themselves, but that'll affect the rest of the food chain higher up. And once the oceans are depleted of all of those mussels and clams, the animals that eat them won't have anything to eat and they'll die off too. And if you like eating clams and oysters, that's going to be bad for you because it's going to affect us being able to fish for them and be able to enjoy them too. We want them to stick around. And one thing a lot of people don't think about when they think of ocean pollution is noise pollution. And that's with, you know, sound waves. So noise pollution generated by shipping and military activity can cause cellular damage. You know, your whole body is made up of tiny little bitty cells. That, and they can damage those little bits into a class of invertebrates that includes jellyfish and anemones. So those little soft, floaty creatures, they don't have the cellular structure to withstand high pressure waves, which can be produced by sound. And they're a vital food source for tuna, sharks, sea turtles, and other creatures. So similarly to the mollusks, if all of the jellyfish and anemone die off, then the tuna, sharks, and sea turtles don't have anything to eat. And we end up with a really bad problem. So we're gonna come off that one for a little bit of a high note here because there's things you can do to help and that's to educate yourselves about the ocean. And by doing that, you can read. So here are some fun stories to soak up the summer about the ocean. Over here is Shark Lady, which is the true story about Eugenie Clark, one of the biggest shark scientists out there. There's also one on Jacques Cousteau, which is really big in ocean exploration and finding out ways to help save it and keep it nice and pretty and clean. We also have Down, 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 which is a fun exploration of different things as you go deeper into the ocean. You'll notice on the cover is a sperm whale and a giant squid, one of its favorite foods. And over on the right here with the jellyfish is the new normal, which is going to talk about the fate of those really squishy creatures and the different types of pollution that are affecting them in the water. And that'll also help you figure out how you can fix it. Now, going off into fiction, stuff that's not true or a little bit true, maybe. Um, down on the bottom, we have Dark Life, which is a dystopian novel about after the ocean levels have risen on this planet due to global warming, a lot of people decide to move to the bottom of the ocean, or at least as the bottom as far as they can get. But they also have a lot better technology than we do. And they have to farm down there, which is how they get their food, because there's no land up top that's not baked by the sun. So they can't grow corn or soybeans or apples or have cows and chickens, that doesn't work. So they just have to find different ways to sustain themselves. And that's gonna be farming on the ocean floor. But our main character, Ty, has a problem. 
because there are underwater gangs as well. And they decide to pretty much invade their homestead and they need to figure out how to get their supplies back, how to get their livelihood back. Fun adventure. Next to that, if you're a fan of the Magic Treehouse, you know that they have really cool research guides and fun fact combos that go along with their stories. And this one's about tsunamis and other natural disasters. Because tsunamis often happen after earthquakes, but they can also be a sign that something is up in the ocean, that something is not right. So if you want to learn more about how the waves and the water are impacted by different things, read that. Next up is Turn the Tide, about a girl who is inspired by an environmental activist to clean up her own hometown and all the junk that is in the ocean. And she makes her own little group of young activists to stand up for the cleanliness of their water. Awesome. And if you want to go over toward the fantasy realm, there's always the tale of Emily Winsnap, which is about a girl who's an awesome swimmer and finds out she's actually a mermaid because it's still fun to think about mermaids in the ocean. So one more, two truths and a lie. The ocean is home to a plethora of amazing creatures, plants, and phenomena. The ocean helps sustain life, not only in its bodies, but all across the earth by serving as a major source of open, um, excuse me, of oxygen, weather, and food, and an all around climate. The ocean is just a giant puddle we can use as we please, and it won't hurt anyone or anything. Well, that one I hope would be easy for you. <laughs> the first two bullet points on this slide are obvious truths, at least to me. And I hope at the end of this presentation, you would know that those are really true as well. The ocean is home to an amazing amount of creatures. So many different things. Even within fish, there's countless things. And we don't even know all about the ocean yet all the animals that are down there. We go down sometimes for just exploration, checking things out, and scientists find new species every time they go down. Isn't that amazing? It's like how long we've been around that we're still finding out new things. And the ocean helps sustain life, not only in its bodies, but all across the earth by serving as a major source of weather, food, and all around climate. Now, a lot of people don't often connect this because the ocean might not be right next to them, but the ocean, the great ocean, all of the water on this planet really drives the weather. And it deals with evaporation, that um, moisture that goes off into the atmosphere, turns into clouds, goes into rain, that wonderful water cycle. It also affects winds because different humidities and different water levels in the atmosphere affect different pressures and how the air moves in our atmosphere. So whether you are far or near to an ocean, you have it to thank for when you have sunny days, when you have rainy days, when there are thunderstorms, when it's really windy, and when it's really hot. Climate change is a really important thing right now. Well, it, it's been for a while, but people need to start paying attention more. And the ocean is a driving force of our climate. It helps everyone. I encourage you to look up some of the books we have in our collection about climate change to help you learn a little bit more. But by helping the ocean, we're helping everybody. We're helping everything on this planet, not just what lives in the ocean. And the ocean is definitely not just a giant puddle that we can do anything we like with. We are not going to be those selfish creatures. We are not. I know you're not going to be. Even though we can't talk with fish, and turtles. We still enjoy them. We love their stories. We love their characters. And they have every right to be here that we do. So let's help protect their homes. And we plan to see more of you this summer. We have so many other fun things that are available for you. Coming up, we have programs about the seashore, about sharks, about map making and exploration. You really need to check them all out. This was just the beginning of our summer reading and our ocean exploration of this big, vast sea of possibility. But you know now the difference between an ocean and the sea. So maybe you don't want to see a possibility. You want an ocean of possibility. Well, good news. That's what we have. 
Thanks again for joining me for our wade in and dive deep. I hope you learned a whole bunch about the ocean today. And if you want to learn more, please come see me at the library. I would love to give you a bunch of books to help you learn about any animals, conservation, climate change that you want to learn about this summer. So we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.